everyone and welcome to another video lecture. Today's lecture we're looking at Rhino and we're looking at curves. Everything about curves, how they work, what they do and really their potential for your surface generation and for architecture moving forward as you use Rhino throughout your career. So the most important thing to understand is that whenever we're drawing anything in Rhino, we're technically drawing a curve. So even if we're drawing a polyline like this one or a rectangle, technically Rhino understands this as a curve. So what do we mean by that? How can a straight line be a curve? Well, how Rhino works is NURBS modeling. And this is the simplest way to understand it. If you remember back to your high school math class when you put points along a line like this, these five points we have here looks kind of like a polyline. If you were to interpolate that curve, you would end up with parabolas like this one. Let's say we're graphing people who passed at this point, failed and did well at this point in a test. These are the people that were above the pass mark, these are the people that below the pass mark and the averages are everything that's in between. So it's really averaging out information. That's effectively what happens. But that process is the creation of a curve. So Rhino understands all of its geometries in terms of curve. So where typical computer modeling excels, like CAD, ARCHICAD, AutoCAD, all of those things, Revit, is in planar geometries like this one here, is in rectilinear forms. It understands them as polygons, as pieces of information. They are finite. Kind of like if you were thinking about it in terms of Photoshop and its pixels. There's a finite amount of information. If you start zooming in, zooming out, rescaling, doing things, you're going to end up with a warped image. With Rhino, it's the equivalent of Illustrator dealing in vectors. No matter how much we zoom in, zoom out, scroll in, scroll out, resize, it's always going to be recalculating the curve. So if I were to pull on this control point here or this one here and move it around, it's always doing the math for us in real time. It's always figuring out what that new graph would be based on the information that we change in it. So it's always ready to go. Nothing's ever finished in terms of the curve. And so that is really powerful as a tool for us because it means we're able to model immensely detailed and complex geometries that just could not happen in normal CAD. So let's take a look at an example here of how Rhino can deal with some curves. So let's say we've got these curves here, just going around like this in our perspective. Let's use the sweep to command and we'll get into more of the commands in the next video with our surface treatments. But I just want to give you an example on what this might look like. So Rhino understands that this is a curve, but it also understands how to map these curves against each other. So this is, you might say, if we were trying to draw this up in CAD, a complex geometry. But for Rhino, it's actually very, very simple. It can deal with immensely complex things. There are infinitely small, infinitely large, infinitely curved and complex. It can handle it. So the reason it can do that is because it's dealing at all times in curves instead of polygons and polylines. So when we talk about curves, that's what we really mean. That's what we're talking about uh, when we're referring to Rhino is the fact that it's uh, mathematical, not the fact that it's aesthetic. So when we're talking about curves, just remember back to this high school math, we're interpolating data and it gives us a curve that is infinitely editable. All right, let's get into some curve talk, more curve talk. In our curve, we have a few different things going on. We have what's called an endpoint. So this point here is the end or the start of our line called an endpoint. And we have another one over this end of our curve. We also have what we can control points, which are these ones here. 
So we can see that as we manipulate these or we control these points, it changes what the curve does. It changes the geometry, it changes the complexity, the intensity or the amplitude. We have a lot of control through the control points. Now, let's have a look at another type of curve. So let's go ahead and have a look at some of the curves we can create here. So we'll go ahead and delete that one for now. I'm going to go the slow way and the long way today. But any of these commands that we use, you can just go ahead and type in. So if we wanted a freeform curve or if we wanted to create a spiral or a helix, we can just type that in. But I'm going to show you the long way so that you know how to find it should you need it. So let's start by having a look at some non-planar curves. So curves that don't align to this plane which we talked about in the last video. So we've got two types. We've got a spiral and a helix. Let's first start with the helix. So remember, Rhino is always going to ask us for information as we go. So we're starting off with our start point, which is in the center. Because the end of our axis, we can either enter information. So if we want it to be specific with an enter, I can go 300. And that's going to show me there. That's what 300 looks like. If I want a little bit bigger, I can do it again, 500. And we can keep editing that trial and erroring that. Or we could just click to another object if we wanted to. So I'm happy with that. So we'll press enter to finish that. And then we can see that we've got a helix running this way, like this. And it's going in the direction that we pointed it in. And we can see it's got a whole lot of edit point curves along this. But it's all the same radius, the same diameter the whole way along. Whereas a spiral is a little bit different. So I'm just going to go out to my four plane mode now to do this one. So let's go back up to curve and now we'll go to spiral this time. Again, we'll start it at this point here. This time I'm going to do my spiral. It's asking me for the end of my axis. So I'm going to go upwards this time. And then we can see that it's now asking us for where we want the spiral to go. I'm going to come out to 100. And then finally, it's asking us where we want our start point to go. So I want my start point on that red axis. And then how wide do we want it to be? So spiral is very much like you might imagine a tornado or a twister or even a screw thread on a screw for timber. Whereas your helix is much more like a bolt. It's the same way the whole way through. So those are two non-planar curves. Let's have a look at some of our planar curves. Let's start by bringing in an image. So this is something that you'll be doing a lot um, as we develop our own surfaces. You might start by looking at surfaces that you find through precedent study and analysis and start by tracing over some of the geometries in there or mirroring some of the patterns that you might see there. So I'm just going to bring this in as a picture. All I've done is drag and dropped it in. I'm then just going to scale it inside here. And I'll bring in a few more as well. This one. Picture. That one. And one more. I'm going to have a look at a few of our different curve types that we have available to us. All right, so first things first, let's do some editing to make our lines a little bit easier, much like we would in AutoCAD. We want to change the transparency of these. So let's click, go over to our properties panel, come up to the property materials. And I'm going to turn these down to about 50% of what they are now. So we can see over the top of them, do the same thing to the other two, 50% as well. There we go, even lighter. Great. Okay. Another thing we want to do is edit our line thickness because we're going to be tracing some curves over the top of these. We want to be able to see, we don't want our line to be too small. So I'm going to go up to Rhino, into Preferences, 
Then the next thing you go to is your display modes. So inside display modes, you can edit each type of uh, viewport window. So remember last week we looked at the different viewports, whether it be wireframe, shaded, rendered, whatever it is. Right now we're in a wireframe viewport, so we're just going to edit that one. Come over to objects, over to here, and then where it says curves, I want you to increase your curve width up to three. So now when you're drawing, you should be able to see your curves nice and clearly. And we'll exit out of that one there. And so your curves should look something like this in terms of their thickness when they're done. Close out of that one, we can see that. Now it's reasonably nice and thick. Of course, you can make it thicker as you need. Okay, so some of the types of curves. First thing we want to talk about is the difference between a closed and an open curve. So I'm just going to make a freeform curve right here. I'm going to almost close it as we can see there. So you can see that this point here, our endpoint, doesn't quite match up with this endpoint. But what would happen if we have our endpoints almost touching each other? So much so that if we were to zoom out, they look like they definitely are touching each other. Well, how would we know whether or not they're touching each other? So we went through this last week. Remember, it's in your details tab over in your properties box while it's selected. And we can see that, yes, it's a valid curve, but it's open. It's not closed. So we would need to go back into there, grab this curve, make sure our snap is turned on, and click to end. Now, if we are to go back to our details, we'll see that it is a closed curve. And that's important to know because as we get into more complexity in our modeling, when curves aren't closed properly, uh, when surfaces aren't closed properly, we end up with functions and commands that don't work properly. So you always want to make sure that you are dealing with your curves closed properly. And we'll get into more of that in a second. All right. Let's have a look at some of the examples of curve types. So over to our curve tab here, we've got our classics like a single line, which we can just draw a line like this one here. We've got line segments, much like this, just kind of like the line tool in AutoCAD. You can draw a bunch of lines, but they're all going to be individual later. They're not going to be connected together. If that doesn't work for us, we want something more like a polyline. Well, hey, we've got polylines as well. So we can just go to polyline, polyline, or remember you can type it in if you want to, but I'll go the long way today. And then we have our polyline, everything nicely connected for us. Where we're going to be spending more of our time is probably more in the realms of the polygons and the freeform curve. So let's have a look at some of our polygons which are also known in Rhino as primitive shapes. If you hear people talking about primitives, they're talking about your polygons. Things like your triangle, or if we change this number of sides here to four, press enter, our square, we change this to five, you guessed it, pentagon, six, hexagon, etc. So we've got access to all of these primitive, primitive shapes inside there. What happens if we turn that up to 100? Well, it starts to look an awful lot like a circle. Of course, the more faces we have, the more curvature we get as well, which is effectively how Rhino works. We have infinite faces, therefore we have curves instead of polygons. All right, so those are our primitive curves. Let's say we wanted to do something like this geometry here, though. We could go into our polylines and create a polyline that goes very slowly around this shape here, but how are we going to make sure that all of our lines are the same length as one another? This is a pure geometry, and as we're designing our surfaces, we are going to need to deal with pure geometries because we're making patterns. And patterns won't line up with one another if they can't be mirrored and replicated infinitely. So we need to be able to deal with some mathematical geometry here. Of course, Rhino has got this covered up in here in our curves tools, we go to polygon, we have a star. So we can figure out where the center point of this star is. 
We can do it first by creating some lines and getting the center point. Uh, right now, for the purposes of illustration, I'm just going to estimate. So first, we need to know the number of sides of our star. So if we count around here, we can see this is a 12-pointed star. So I put 12 in there, and you say, well, that looks like uh, dodecahedrons. Looks like some 12-sided nonsense here, but trust me, keep going. We're getting there. So we click out to the end point of our star, and we click back into the inner points of our star, and there we have it, a perfect star shape where each one of these vertices is exactly the same as one another. We also have, obviously in our gumball tool that we talked about last week, option to move the star around. We feel like we didn't quite get it where we wanted to. And then we come down to design uh, liberty. If you feel like when you're tracing over a surface or something, you might be working on some heritage facade work or something like that, and you say, well, actually, this is handmade, so it's not mathematically perfect. So what I want to do is select my individual control points and just start to massage these and make sure they are actually lining up the way we want to line up. So it depends on you and what you're doing. You have that control, of course. Whenever we see control points, it means you have control as the designer. So that's our polygons, our shapes, and our stars. Let's have a look at some circles and ellipses. So we go, once again, back over to curve and then to circle. And we've got a few options here to get our circle started. So if we were to go center and then radius, let's say we wanted to get this circle here, our center, and then our radius gives us a circle inside there. We've got a few other options as well. We can grab our circle again. This time it's asking for a two point. So it might go inside here and then over to the other point on the other side. And a few other options in there for you to play with too. Let's now say we want to get an ellipses because this isn't a pure circle, particularly this one up here. So again we go up to ellipses from center. Get our center point, get our radius, and then up to the top. And we can see that that wasn't quite in the center where we wanted it, so we can stretch that around and we can manipulate these and pull those around and do what we need to do inside the ellipses there. So ellipses is effectively a circle that has a, a squished top and bottom that you can manipulate. Then finally, we go to our arc tools. So let's say we wanted to get these arcs in on this gothic facade that we have here. So arc, we've got a couple of options, a center and then a start and then the angle. So if we say that this is the center point from here to here, top and bottom, come out to the radius and then we draw in the part that we want, I find that the this method is really quite complicated and difficult to figure out. Most of the time in architecture, the one that works for us is the same as the one in AutoCAD as well. So we have a start point, we have an end point, and then we have an angle that we give it, which we see works much better there. And then we have our arc in place. Next, we want to go over to control point curves or our freeform curves. So say, for example, we're not dealing with things like a perfect arc or a star or a square or primitive geometries. We've got things like this, which are made up of multiple curves, curves all over the shop. If that's the case, then we're going to spend a lot of time with that if we're freeform curves. And you would have seen me before playing around with a freeform curve, which was this one here, which is where I can just manipulate curves by clicking points in space. Uh, it's a really powerful tool in Rhino as well. The long form way to find that, the freeform curve, is back up in curve, freeform, and then we've got a few different options. So let's have a look at each one of those. Control point curves is the first one. So we start up here, and we're going to go around this gourd here. And we can effectively just click in the places that we want it to be, and it will create nice arc for us. Control point is 
the most common one that we would be using for tracing over things. It gives us a nice curve. And also because it is a control point curve, we can then zoom in afterwards and massage those points and make sure they are where we need them to be. So let's just hide this layer for a second so that, that stops going there. So go back to our control points, pull this one. We can see that we've got a lot of flexibility here in terms of getting this curve to be perfectly where we want it to be. So we can zoom right the way in and get our curve happening. Control point curves, you'll see, if I play with one control point curve, it's only really going to impact the next two control points. If you look at the top and bottom of this board, it's not really getting affected as I make this, even if I do something quite extreme like this, it's only the two closest points that are really getting affected. Uh, but you'll see that's quite different as we get into some of the other curves. Let's now have a look at the interpolate curves. So jump back up to curves, freeform interpolate curves. And again, we just follow along with our mouse, but we see that this time now, depending where we put our mouse in the next control point, is going to change the curvature of the previous one. So some people find this better to use in terms of getting a consistent arc. Some people find it a bit frustrating to get it to work, uh, but it really depends on you and your workflow. And then finally, delete that one go up to curve free form and then a handle curve so handle curve is a little bit different in terms of how it works because each time we create a uh, a new arc to the curve it's asking us to effectively plot where these handles are in space so effectively we're lock in this curvature so if i were to click here and keep moving we see that We've now created this new curvature relative to the handles. If I didn't like that last one, I could just press Control Z, Command Z, and it will give me an opportunity to, to redo that last one. And so it's, a, it's one of the ones that requires a little bit of practice. And the more you do it, the more you'll get used to it. Uh, but it is a, it's a personal taste thing very much so. Uh, OK, let's just finish that one. All right, so one thing that I would like to mention though is that when working with your curve freeform handle curve, we do tend to see a little bit more of a jaggedness to our curves as we're working. And that's just because of the nature of the handles uh, working in opposite directions and it'll get smoother the more you work with it. Uh, but you'll find that uh, it, is a little bit less uh, simple to, to work with. So I often recommend first time people to just jump ahead to either the control points or the interpolate points. Totally up to you. Okay, so let's go ahead and delete that. And I wanna talk about some of our curves analysis tools. So let's go ahead and go to curve freeform control point. I'm just going to make a curve something like this. Let's say that this is the perimeter fence for a retaining wall in a garden. And uh, we've been looking at Oscar Niemer and we really like that kind of stuff and we've done some organic forms in the landscape architecture. The builder then says to us, well, how long is this thing? How much fencing do I need to buy? How many bricks do I need to buy? I can't really get a, a linear meter out of this. What are we going to do? So that comes in our analyze tool. So analyze is quite powerful. And we'll see more and more as we get into the software that you can actually use the data that you gain from analyzing your curves to manipulate the form entirely. But for now, let's just have a look at analyze and length. And we can see down here, it's telling us that this is exactly one meter, 433 mils. So we know that the whole length of this thing all the way along is 1.5 meters. If we were to change that and manipulate the curve and play around the control points, we just go back into analyze length. 
would see that it's gotten slightly bigger. So quite useful to see what's going on in terms of the dimensions. Another thing you can do is, which is very helpful, is to analyze the radius as you're working. So if you follow your mouse around your curvature, you can see that it effectively makes these circles that are the size of the radius at that point along the curve. So we can see if I were to start my fence from this point, this is the radius here. If I did the next point of my fence here, that's the radius. If I want to know what this tight little circle is down here, that's my radius there, and another one up here. So it can make your life a little bit easier by just analyzing your curves, figuring out what your radiuses are. So for example, if you're working in Revit or AutoCAD and you've drawn something like this, but it's impossible for you to figure out how to model it or how to make it work or anything like that, you could just quickly bring it over to Rhino and analyze the curve. Uh, so all I need to do is click in these main points that I want to see, click in there as well, click in there for that one and click in there and then hit enter to say that I'm done. Down here I now have both the diameter and radius for each one of those. So I can see the first one was 105 mil in radius, the next one was only 4.7 which was that tiny one here and so on, which is really quite useful. And then the final one I want to show you for your curves analysis is your direction. So we can see that we've got arrows here that are telling us the direction of the curve. It's going from left to right, just like this. And if we click on it, we can change the direction. So it's now going from right to left. Now you might question, well, why is this important? Why do we need to know which direction the curve was going? And it comes back to your surface tools and your solid tools that you're going to be using later as we get further into the software. Rhino will understand your commands based on what direction your curves are traveling. So your command might look completely different if your curves are traveling in one direction over another. So you need to know how to quickly change the directions of your curves. And so this is done through analyze and direction. And you can very quickly just click on the line and change the direction of the curve and make sure your curves are flowing in one direction. So for example, we had another curve that was going the opposite direction, but we wanted them all working the same way so that we could do some surface tools. We could very quickly go in there and make sure that they're all going the same direction. All right, now let's talk about some of the curve basics things that we would have seen a lot in softwares like AutoCAD. So I'm going to add another curve in here. Let's go to Curve Freeform Control Points. And I'm going to put one in here like that. And then I'm going to do another one going here like that. Now, we know that we've got one, two, three curves going on here. If we were to select all of them, and then come over to here, this little tool, which is join, or just type in join or J. We can join the three of those together. And Rhino then tells us down the bottom here, three curves join into one closed curve. Closed being very important, remember, making sure that these things are all in a continuous loop. The opposite is also true. So if we had a bunch of curves here together, already joined, but we wanted to edit just one segment, we've got that handy explode tool that we've seen many times in AutoCAD as well. So after we've exploded, we can then pull this out, make some changes to this specific curve, and then chuck it back where we wanted to have it, do whatever we need to do, etc. We can join those back together. Okay, and then we there we go, one closed curve once again. Now let's have a look at our control point. So we know that when we have a curve like this, Rhino is always going to show us our control points and the control points are very much manipulatable and we can change our geometry through the control points. But what if we wanted to edit the specific points that we clicked along the line here? So what if we wanted to edit these points along this edge rather than the control points? 
So if we are to go into edit, control points, and then show edit points, we actually get the specific points along the line. So say we're tracing over something in order to make our surface and we want our line to line up exactly with this green line that's on this edge here. All of our points needed to be starting and ending along that point. Well, with our edit points, we can get very, very specific with the line rather than guessing by using control points. You hit escape, escape to finish the command, click the line again, and it's gone back to control points. So we can see now we would have had to get this control point out to here in order to get it lining up with that green line. So it just gives you another option to edit your curves by going through the edit and then control points and then your show edit points. We've got some other useful tools in here as well. Sometimes you want to be able to edit your curve without seeing all the points, particularly once you get a lot of complexity and a lot of points in there. You want to be able to just go and hide your points along there. So I'm going to select all of them, click enter, and we can see that it's now hidden all of our stuff, except for one here that's just fell and fallen off the page. So that makes it very much editable. We can see what's going on while we're working. Then we press escape, escape, click it again. We can see that they've come back. Control points are always there by default. You can hide them if you need to for a particular move. We've also got some other helpful, helpful tools inside there. Let's say, for example, we've got this lovely curvature here, but we want to introduce a, a sharper angle in here, which Rhino calls a kink. So if we go to edit, control points, insert kink, we can click inside here along the path, hit enter to finish. We now have a very much sharp angle inside there, which we can see here is much, much sharper than it was, and another control point here to manipulate. So we've now split effectively this curve into two curves and a kink. Okay, let's have a look at the smooth tool. So let's say, for example, we'll delete this one so we can see what we're doing. We've got a curve um, let's go with a handle curve this time just to get it a bit more jumpy. And we can hold down Alt while we're working to get some sharp points in there as well. And I'll press Enter to finish the curve. So say we've got a bunch of curves like this, but we find that actually what we need is another interpolation of this. We don't quite need all these curves going on and speaking to the client it's all a bit busy we just want to smooth it out a bit without having to go and rework all of this so we can then go up here to transform and then smooth and then we'll see we've got a new line here which is the black one which is just making a little bit smoother inside there and we can do some edits in here so we can turn this up up to let's say 0.3 and then we can turn this up here and we see the more we add this up the closer it's getting to zero so if we remember back to our maths zero is where the graph uh, neutrals out and then going above and below in our parabolas is when it's getting more extreme so effectively we were just getting rid of the top and the bottom we're clipping the planes so we can see this top here is now ended up down there this bottom here is ended up there so we're finding the midpoint effectively between all of this stuff here. So we can see if we turn this up, it's just going to get more and more midpointy. But if we just wanted to smooth it a little bit, make it a little bit less intense, we can do that as well, as you see here. So smooth tool is very useful, particularly when you're dealing with lots of different curves at the same time. And you want to be able to smooth them out rather than editing each of them individually. We can just smooth the whole curve. All right, let's look at the extend tool. So say we have another curve. Uh, let's go with the control point curve this time. Doing something like this. And we want to be able to extend this curve to that curve there. Now, we could, of course, just grab our control point. But you'll see over here 
that it's actually editing my arc and it's changing that. So if I'd spent hours tracing over a pattern or something like that, it would really frustrate me if I have to then go back in and edit the control points and make sure it's all still working again. So there's a faster way to do that. We can just use the extend tool. So let's go up to curve, extend curve, extend curve. So of course, Rhino is going to ask us what we need. Let's just click on that one. This is the curve we want to extend. And it's asking us how we want to extend it. So we can just extend as a normal line like this one here. Or we can click to point and we can extend it with another arc as well, which we see there. And then we've got some different options here about how we want it to, to resolve it. And then when we're done, we click enter as well. And we can see now that we have one arc meeting another arc. So this curvature that we had here has been maintained, but we have an arc which is coming out of the endpoint there, which is meeting up with our point there. Could have been a straight line if we wanted to. Uh, that's up to us. Let's have a look at the split command. So say that we want to just deal with this arc inside here. And we've got some lines. So just type in line space. One there, space bar to start again, the same move. Say I want to deal with just this specific arc. Now, if we were to use the trim command, so say we type in trim, and we've got our two cutting objects. If we trim that bit out, oops, sorry, control and click to deselect, enter and click, we see that, well, that's not very useful to us because we've gotten rid of the part we wanted to see and I, I could put two very close together and then trim out there and then trim out there and then reconnect them but it's kind of frustrating I don't really want to do that I want to have just this part and I don't want to do all that extra work so what I can do is use the split command split this is the object I want to split I press enter and then I get my cutting objects again and press enter now I've got my arc here that I can play with and manipulate put it back as needed and delete these when they're ready to go. Next, let's have a look at an offset tool. I'm going to go ahead and delete these. Make a freeform curve. Let's make something interesting like this. Okay, so we've got a, a nice little alto vase shape, something like that. I want to offset inside of here. Type in offset. And then I can see how much it's offsetting by. Type in 20, hit enter. And I can see inside there or outside there. And I've got my offset curve. Now that's really handy because if you were to just scale this, it would scale it specific to its center point and you'll find that these curves won't be an exact offset of 20 millimeters at all sides so it wouldn't work effectively by scaling so offset in Rhino is very powerful. Let's say instead we've got a curvature which has some polys in it as well so we know that would be our freeform and our handle curve. So let's get a couple of normals happening inside here. And then I'm going to hold down Alt. And again, inside there. So I've got some polys as well as some curves, some right angles, I should say. If I was to offset this, we'll see that as I come out here, it's ending up with some complex forms. Now, if I go to press enter, oops, sorry, if I do offset again, enter, I've got options here in terms of what my corner is doing. So if I go to round and I have a look here, I can see it's now got a round corner and I can see that it's solved that issue that was out there. I can go to smooth, let's change it again instead of it being 
just a round surface. It's smoothed off the edge. I can go for a chamfer. So I can see a chamfer in there. And so it's effectively giving us a lot of control over how we deal with this curve. So again, quite powerful. This tool will be used again and again. And I want to give you an example of just something to have a little bit of fun with after this session too. So let's say we had our offset curves ready to go. We then type in extrude curve and we want to extrude that one upwards. I want it to be solid and I want it to go up by 400. If I then change my perspective view to shaded, you'll see that we've got quite an interesting extrusion which has come out of here. Very, very, very nice. Okay, and we do have another option with our offsets. So let's say, for example, we've got some curves doing a few different things. Got a curve doing this, and another one coming in from the other way, like this. Now, when we get into Rhino, when we sorry, into surface and solid modeling later, we talked about having issues with our curves going the right direction. We also have issues when curves aren't in the same curvature and tangent. So we could see if we were to continue this curve along, it would want to go this way down here like this. If we were to continue this one along, it would want to continue on an arc like this. So often that will cause issues for us when we're trying to do some complex modeling. So what we would need to do is one of a few options. Let's look at the match command first. So if we were to type in match or to go up to curve, curve edit tools, match, we click on the open curve, click on the one to match, and we'll see that it's now getting this geometry. So it's continued along that path there. If we do it the opposite way, spacebar to repeat the move, we'll go this way now and click this one. We'll see it's continued the curvature this way. So what it's doing is it's correcting the other line to follow along the curvature of the first path that we select. So this one here is now following along as we can see. So instead of going the opposite direction, we now have curves that are going in the right direction. We can play around with a few different elements here, tangency versus curvature, and preserving the other end as well. And we click match curve, and we see that we now have a beautiful curve that is all talking to itself. Sometimes that is too much of a change though. We saw that all of this was disappearing when we did that. Uh, so we do have another option, and that is the fillet tool. So if we go to curve, fillet curves, we can change this radius to 20 so that we can see what we're doing. Click this one here and this one here, and we can see that there's a new bit of curvature inside there. And let's just exaggerate that a little bit more. So fill it. I'm going to turn that up to 100. This one to this one. And we can see we now have a filleted arc there. And Effectively, what that does is it means this curve is now going to be balanced into this curve because we have a fillet, which is changing the direction for us nicely. So that's another option for us instead of match. If we wanted to maintain this arc along here, maintain this one along here, but we want them to talk to each other nicely, we can fillet the two and bring them together. Finally, our last tool I want to talk about is the rebuild tool. So let's say, for example, we wanted to have a few more control points along here because we wanted to be able to edit this arc and manipulate it. But at the moment, I've only really got this one piece of, of control here in terms of its edit points. And if we turn the gumball off here, you'll see what I mean. So if I pull on this, I can't really edit just this side over here without pulling everything else out of whack. So what I want to do is I want to do what's called rebuilding the curves. So if we go into edit and rebuild, 
we'll see here as we're previewing that it's adding a few more curves in here. So if I go up to 20 and click preview, we'll see that I've now got a lot more dots along this line here. If I were to do the opposite and change it to four, we'll see that it's now just smoothing the curve right the way out because we've got a lot less control points on that curve. 10 does this, 50 does this. As we can see, we don't really need 50. We might need something like 15, maybe 20. We want to find something that gives you a balance to make sure we're not disrupting our curve too much, but isn't giving us too many control points to manipulate as well. Click Rebuild. I can then edit these control points as necessary as I want to do to manipulate them without affecting what's going on over here. And that is the Rebuild tool. So that is curves in a nutshell. We've gone through a lot of things here. We've talked about our basic geometries, our primitive forms and our polygons. We've talked about how to create basic shapes in polylines and rectangles. We've talked about our different types of freeform curves. We even looked at how to create a star as well. We've got our circles, our arcs, our ellipses. And then we've got a lot of options in terms of how we might fill up the curves, extend the curves, bend the curves. We can join, explode, trim, split, rebuild, do all the things that we need to do. We've also got curve analysis, transformation as well. All of these things work together to make for very, very powerful modeling because this is just the lines that we're editing. Soon we'll get into the surfaces and the solids, but you can see where this is going. If we have this much control over curvature, it means that we can create any shape that we can imagine. Really, really powerful stuff. So I want you to have a play, play around with the different types of curves, drag and drop in some patterns into Rhino, try and trace over them, try and make some of your own patterns and have some fun with it. The next video, we will look at surfaces and look forward to seeing you.